Thank you for joining us at Bibana Virtual Con 2020. We're here now with a reading from our co-guest of honor for this year and also will be our co-guest of honor next year. That's right. He's a two for one. It's Keith R.A. DeCandido. Hopefully I said that correctly. You didn't. Sorry, sir. It's okay. Everybody mispronounces it. It's DeCandido. Hi, I'm Keith R.A. DeCandido. Um, I'm going to be reading for you from my urban fantasy novel, A Furnace Seal which is the first book in the adventures of Bram Gold. Uh, Bram Gold is a courser, which who is basically a supernatural hunter for hire in New York City. Uh, he works primarily in the Bronx, which is the northernmost part of New York. Um, the, the, the book came about, I live in the Bronx. I've lived in the Bronx for most of my life. And the, um, usually when people write stories that take place in New York City, where they actually take place is Manhattan south of 125th Street and the rest of the city, which is considerable, is generally ignored. Uh, well, okay, sometimes Brooklyn. You know, they want to get really edgy. But um, I, I thought the Bronx deserved a little love. So Brahm lives and works in the Bronx. Uh, and the, uh, this particular novel, A Furnace Sealed, deals with some uh, history of the Bronx, uh, going back to colonial times. And uh, this particular sequence that I'm going to do uh, is, Brahm is one of many coursers all throughout the world, really. Um, but the local coursers in the Bronx uh, tend to, on Sunday nights, get together at a bar uh, in the Woodlawn neighborhood of the Bronx, which is a very Irish neighborhood and which has several little bars all up and down uh, the main drag. And uh, they gather in one of those, and basically on Sunday nights is when the coursers all get together and basically have a big bullshitting session <laughs> um, where they just sit around and drink. In this particular case, uh, a courser named Hughes Alti, who is the person who trained Brahm, uh, his daughter just graduated from college. So they're celebrating that also. So, um, so we pick up, this is chapter six of the novel, uh, with Brahm heading off for the Sunday night debauchery. Around 9 p.m. that night, after a refreshing nap and an even more refreshing shower, I called a cab company and had a car take me over to Woodlawn. No way I was going to drive, as I was guaranteed to be too impaired to operate a motor vehicle within an hour of my arrival. Less if Huge was already there toasting his daughter. And mass transit would take too long, as it required two buses to get from Riverdale to Woodlawn on a Sunday schedule, no less. As a general rule, neighborhoods in New York were always changing, and Woodlawn was no exception. A tiny wedge between the Bronx River Parkway, the Yonkers border, Van Cortlandt Park, and Woodlawn Cemetery, this neighborhood of narrow streets and small houses started out as an enclave for German and Italian immigrants in the early 20th century, but by the 1970s or so, became almost exclusively populated by Irish immigrants. Up and down Katona Avenue, the only street inside the neighborhood that was commercial, were dozens of pubs. A lot of them catered to emigres from particular counties in Ireland. One place, in between a bakery and a private house was the Kingfisher's Tale. Six days out of the week, it was a county Wicklow Haven, where folks who'd emigrated from that county came to hoist a few. Sundays, though, the owner, the owner only opened the door bar to courses. Brendan Sheehan's family came to the U.S. when he was 10 years old. He became a courser when he was 20, and he retired when he was 35 after blowing out his knee chasing down a rabid werewolf. His parents owned the bar, and he'd run it with them after he retired, taking over when they died. For 25 years now, the Kingfisher's Tale was known as a Corsa bar, at least on Sundays. When Hughes first took me here after I turned 21, I saw Sheehan standing behind the bar, his salt and pepper hair flopping over his face. He had said to me then, nobody came on Sundays. They had all been out Saturday night and spent Sunday morning confessing their sins at church. Sunday night, they were still repenting, so I figured, Let's boost business and give my old lads a place to hang their sides. I had immediately turned to Huge. We get sides? He had glowered at Sheehan. What you gotta be putting ideas in the child's head for? Sheehan had just grinned and grabbed a bottle of rum with one meaty hand and poured it into a glass, followed quickly by using those huge paws of his to pull a light beer from the tap and to put them in front of Hughes without him having to ask for it, which was the coolest thing ever to 21 year old me. Of course, tonight when I walked in, it was my usual that she and poured as soon as he saw me enter, an amber beer, though I seriously considered ordering a single malt in Warren's honor. The Kingfisher was your basic hole in the wall. Small sign over the blue door and lettering that was really hip when it was first painted in 1977, 
with the silly drawing of a bird that sort of kind of looked like a kingfisher next to it. Sheehan had touched up both the lettering and the artwork over the decades, but refused to change it. Then no one would be able to find the place, was his usual rejoinder on the subject. Once you pushed open the blue door, which you sometimes needed to throw your shoulder into as the damn thing kept sticking, you saw an old wooden bot top taking up the right-hand side of the narrow space, with tiny round tables all around the floor arranged in no particular pattern or order, making it impossible to walk in a straight line anywhere in the room. Luckily, few people ever were capable of walking in a straight line when they were in here, so it all worked out. The one and only change Sheehan had made to the place over the decades that wasn't straight up maintenance was replacing the stools at the bar and the cheap wooden chairs at the tables with wireframe chairs that gave you back support. Don't know about the regulars who were here from Monday to Saturday, but the guys who were constantly nursing nagging injuries like ribs bruised by crazed unicorns appreciated that little bit of ergonomic assistance. I should add that chapter one of this book is from getting his ribs injured by a crazed unicorn. When I entered, the first thing I noticed was that a bunch of the tables had been pushed together so Hughes could hold court. I figured he was carrying on about Antoinette's graduation. The second thing I noticed was how warm it was. It had gotten about 10 degrees colder outside and I regretted not wearing something thicker than my denim jacket. I approached the bar where Sheehan stood. His salt and pepper hair had gone completely white over the past nine years and it also thinned considerably, but it still flopped over his face. He had my beer poured by the time I snaked my way through the tables to the bar. Abby Cornwell was asking, so did she look beautiful in her cap and gown? Cornwell was one of three women in the bar. Amusingly, we had one blonde, who was tan, one brunette, who was mixed race with coffee colored skin, and one redhead who was incredibly pale. Cornwell was the blonde. There were a dozen men, 13 now that I came in, 14 if you counted Sheehan, which was about the ratio in general of male to female courses as it happened. Jesus, no, Hughes said, his flat face forming into a frown. She looked like she was wearing a damn tarpaulin, okay? They all did. Sal Antonelli held up a glass of red wine near his acne-scarred face, framed as it was by a hairdo that was just shy of a pompadour and sideburns down to his jawline. How boring were the speeches? Completely, Hughes shuddered and sipped more of his rum. The salutatorian talked in a damn monotone. And the valedictorian sounded like someone fed her helium before the speech, okay? I could not even say what the speeches were about. I came over to join the group with my beer. I'm going to go out on a limb and say they were about the future and the importance of education. Why do you say that? Antonelli asked. They're all about that. Huge frown. When do you get here, child? I sighed, having long since given up asking, getting him to stop calling me child. Just now. Obviously, I'm behind on drinking since you're facing the door and you didn't see me come in. I was telling my story. Hey, it's fine. It's not like you taught me to be aware of my surroundings or anything. There weren't any chairs around the table available, but Eddie Malopatra got up from his. Here, Bram, take mine. No, no, I can't, I started, but he waved me off. It's fine. I need to get home to Indira and the baby. Little Martine is sick. Huge pointed at Eddie's diminutive form. I am only forgiving this transgression because you have a daughter, okay? Eddie bowed his head. Thank you. Congratulations again to Tony. I'll see the rest of you around. Everyone wished Eddie a good night, and he headed out. He had gotten out of his seat without pushing it back. You can do that when you're 5'4". But I had to pull it out to get my taller frame into it, which I did after shrugging out of my jacket and draping it over the back. Eddie had left his Coke unfinished. Guy's got a sick kid at home, and he still puts it in appearance for Hughes' celebration. Sweet guy. Hughes went back to pontificating. Now, the worst part of the whole thing, okay? That was the keynote. The man was some kind of descendant of the man who founded the university. Albert Gallatin? That was Dahlia Reese Markham, the brunette among the trio of women in the bar, and also the one we all wanted as our partner on trivia night. Seriously, she knew everything about everything. I made a mental note to ask her what she knew about immortals in the Bronx later. Or maybe tomorrow. Later, we were all unlikely to be upright. How the hell should I know the man's name? I was falling asleep during the speech, okay? Started drooling out of my mouth onto my nice suit. I held up a hand. Wait a sec. You were wearing a suit? Of course I was wearing a suit. You own a suit? I do now, he grinned. It was Tony's graduation, okay? You got an issue with that child? Shaking my head, I said, no, no, no issue at all. I'm just impressed that you spent more than 10 bucks on an article of clothing. That must have been traumatic. 
Hughes just snarled at me and said, someone shoot this child with a crossbow. Hey, none of that, Sheehan cried out. You know how hard it is to get blood out of the floor? You want to kill golds, do it outside. Thanks, Brendan. Appreciate the support. I shot him a mock annoyed glance. Antonelli said, actually, Gold's right. You usually dress like shit. Shoot him, too, Usually yelled. Everyone laughed, and Hughes talked about the graduation some more, and then I had another beer. And then Dahlia started talking about her son's high school graduation and how it was the first time she and her ex-husband spoke in 10 years. And then I had another beer. And then Antonelli talked about his own high school graduation when a snake ate the principal, which lasted right up until I pointed out that that was the third season finale of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and then he admitted that he didn't actually graduate high school. So he told the story of why he dropped out instead, and then Dahlia left when I ordered another beer, which annoyed me as I wanted to ask her about Immortals, and then I had a bunch more beer. Also, beer. At one point, not long after Hughes passed out and was snoring in his chair, the blue door got shoved open to reveal a barrel-chested Latino gentleman with a crew cut and a perpetual scowl. Bernie Itteral Dahlia. I tensed and flinched at the same time at his arrival. His blue trench coat was streaked with stains of various colors as it swooshed behind him like a second-rate cape. I figured he kept the blood and dirt stains from his work as a courser on the coat to make himself look tough, but to me it made him just look like a grown-up who didn't know how to do his own laundry. He went straight for the bar, and everyone got a little quieter. He didn't bother to take his coat off and hang it up like everyone else had. Shit, this a fucking funeral or what? She and poured him as usual tequila. No, just got quiet after Baptiste pap passed out. Good, means I don't got to listen to him talk about his fucking daughter all night. Cornwell and the other woman who'd come, a redhead whose name my beer-induced brain could no longer recall, both said they had to leave and headed out the door. Hey, Itteralde said, you fuckers hear about the vamp? What vamp? Antonelli asked. We got us a vamp on a motherfucking killing spree. Got Ben Palmer, and I already got that homeless guy who said he was immortal. That got everyone started. Ben Palmer died? Who the hell's Ben Palmer? Rich dude up in Riverdale. Jesus, that homeless guy who drinks fancy bourbons or something? Scotch, I thought. You know anything about it, Bram? That last was from Antonelli. I've been hoping to stay out of it, but Antonelli looked right at me. I sighed and tried to get my beer-addled brain to stop swimming. I'm actually the one who found Warren's body. Uh, he's a homeless guy, and he really is immortal. Or was, I guess. And uh, so's Palmer. Palmer was a fucking immortal? Itteralde asked, incredulous. Jesus fucking Christ. So I'm not even sure this is a, even a vampire. I mean, sure, it looks it, but we don't even know COD yet. Itteralde frowned. Cash on delivery? I laughed out loud, though it wasn't that funny. Yay, beer. No, uh, <laughs> cause of death. Sorry, doctor term. What the fuck ever. They both got fucking puncture wounds in their fucking necks. We got to do something. Ever since my parents got... I winced, and half the bar finished his sentence for him. Killed by a Jiangxi! Itteralde never went more than 20 minutes without mentioning that Chinese undead creatures killed his parents. He claimed it was also why he wore turtlenecks. That woke Hughes up, and he blurted out something in French. Welcome back, Sheehan said with a chuckle. What's going on? Antonelli said, Bernie wants to kill vampires. After slugging back all of his tequila and pointing at the shot glass by way of requesting another shot from Sheehan, Itteralde said, who fucking doesn't want to kill vampires? Huge sat up. I prefer something challenging. Besides, who would even be paying for that? Vamps, I'll kill for free. After my parents, I'm always ready to go 10 rounds with a fucking vamp. You wouldn't be going too, Huge said. Huge is right, I said, and we don't have proof. Not only that, I'm not too sure a vampire could kill an immortal, much less two. Antonelli asked, you sure Palmer's an immortal? That's what Miriam told me. Yeah, well, Itteralde said, what the fuck does she know? I whirled on him, which just made my head swim more. Excuse me? He held up a hand. Look, I know she's your friend in all gold, but let's face it, she got tossed in the fucking deep end. She barely knows her ass from her elbow. And the pot calls the kettle black, I said. Look, we don't know for sure what killed those two. Well, maybe you and the war dean don't, but I do. Look, I know you fucking people like to talk shit about vamps, but they're still fucking vampires. They live on blood. That makes them bad guys in my book. John McAnally, a tall, wiry, pale specimen who was a regular at the pub during the week as well, spoke up for the first time all evening. Bernabe's right for all that he is blaspheming. Vampires are evil and must be stopped. This is a job, Johnny, 
you said. And I, for one, won't be hunting anything that might try to eat me unless there is a payday at the conclusion. At the very least, Antonelli said, we should keep an eye out. Jesus, shit. What does that even mean? Hughes shook his head and dry sipped his drink. Brendan! Without missing a beat, Sheehan said, another one coming up. Hughes regarded Antonelli with a look I got a lot when I was apprenticing with him. We should keep an eye out. We should always be keeping an eye out. But that don't mean we go off half cocked. I swallowed some more beer and then said, and if you do go off half cocked, Miriam's going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. Why? It's her all they said with a sneer. You going to tell her? After all, your head's so far up the war dean's ass, your fucking nose is sticking out of her fucking belly button. I tamped down my initial response, which was to punch him in the solar plexus, same thing I wanted to do the first time I met him, and every other time I saw him since, and instead just said, I won't need to tell Miriam anything if you go and do something stupid like you did in Castle Hill. That fucking vamp was asking for it. After all, they snapped, and he jumped off his bar stool and started moving toward me. Hey, she had said, not in here. Or anywhere else, thanks, I said quickly. I started the weekend going three rounds with a unicorn. Oh, yeah, Antonelli said. I heard about that. The Cloisters, right? Amazingly, that got us off the subject of vampires. Within seconds, I was telling a wrapped bar full of courses about my adventures on 180th, and then Rodzinski being a schmuck, and then me calling Velez. I may have slurred a few words while doing so because beer, but I think I told it okay. McAnally said, Mr. Velez said it was hard to get the unicorn back in, you say? Yeah. I gulped down the last of my latest beer as my lips and throat were dry from telling the story. Why? For a second, McAnally looked away. Then he stood up and looked abashed. What I speak of does not go beyond these walls. With a pointed look at me, Itteralde said, I don't tattle. What are you, six? I shook my head, but I won't say anything either. Everyone else agreed. And then McAnally cleared his throat. Father Ginty has a Felinus that he captured some time ago. It's Eralde frowned. Fuck is a Felinus? It's a dog that can win any battle and turn water into wine by splashing in it, I said, dredging up a lesson I learned from Mike Zarelli a long time ago. McAnally nodded. The father kept it in a binding for emergencies. Antonelli snorted. What, if he runs out of communion wine? I did not presume to ask, McAnally said tightly. But my point in telling the tale is that it is quite similar to what Abraham just told. I was forced to corral the beast, and then the father hired Miss Fofana to restore the binding spell. She mentioned the difficulty she had in restoring it, just as Mr. Velez did. Huge glowered at me. Why were you hiring Velez anyhow, child? I thought you and Vanessa Fofana were tight. I looked away. She's, uh, she's pissed at me. Antonelli chuckled. Still? What did you do to her? Huge asked. I don't want to talk about it. Then Guthrie and Chatwal told a story about a shahap head infestation that they had to clear out, and that changed the subject again, thank goodness. Eventually, closing time rolled around. It was just huge me, Guthrie, and Itteralde left. Chatwal had stayed just long enough to help Guthrie tell the shahap head story, and then he went home, leaving his husband to stay social. Me, Itteralde, and Guthrie had to help huge to the street. There were a bunch of private cabs all up and down Katona Avenue to get the drunks home safely. We poured Hughes into one of them, and then Guthrie walked off. He and Chatwell lived in Yonkers, about a 20-minute walk, and he preferred to hoof it home. After Guthrie wandered away, Itteralde looked at me. I'm going after the vamps, Gold. They need stopping, and I'm the guy to stop them. Then he got into a cab. I sighed. This was very not good. But I'd deal with it in the morning. Right now, I needed to try to remember my address so I could tell the cabbie where to take me so I could sleep off all this beer. And that is the end of chapter six. Um, a Furnace Sealed is available from uh, all your basic online book dealers from Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, iTunes, Powell's, you name it. Uh, they've probably got it. Uh, you can also get it. Trade paperback and the ebook are available from pretty much everyone. Um, the hardcover, I believe, is only available from Amazon. I'm not sure about that exactly, but you can definitely get the ebook from anywhere. Uh, I am working on book two of the Bram Gold Adventures, which will tentatively be titled Feet of Clay. Um, feet spelled F-E-A-T. And um, I'm, uh, I've also written two, uh, three other stories that take place in the same universe. One involves Bram, uh, and it's called, Liar, it's called uh, Under the King's Bridge, 
It originally appeared in an anthology called Liar Liar in 2011 and was reprinted in my short story collection without a license, which uh, came out in, uh, the, new, the current edition came out in 2018. Um, and there's also two stories featuring a different courser, a woman named Yolanda Rodriguez. Uh, one is in an anthology that just came out called Badass Moms, which was just released by Crazy Eight Press. And another Yolanda story is going to be in Horns and Halos, which is coming out end of this year, beginning of next year, from Eastbeck Books. Uh, that's currently being crowdfunded, actually. We've already made our goal. But uh, if you go to Kickstarter uh, and search for uh, Lucky Devils, uh, you'll find it. Or search for Eastbeck Books. There's a Kickstarter for, for that that's going on. You can still support it. There'll be a Yolanda story there. Yolanda is also going to be in Feet of Clay along with Brahm and all, most of the people you saw in that scene as well. Um, I've also written a bunch of little vignettes. Uh, I have a Patreon, uh, like many writers. Uh, and my Patreon is pretty, pretty straightforward. But one of the things it's featured is vignettes featuring my original characters. And I've written more than half a dozen uh, vignettes featuring Brahm. And a lot of them are scenes like the one I just read. They're, they're hanging out at the Kingfisher's tail on a Sunday night and telling stories. So uh, there's a bunch of those there as well. I'm probably going to be reprinting some of them in the back of Feet of Clay. We'll see. Um, I have to talk to Wordfire Press about that. I'm hoping for Feet of Clay to be out sometime in early 2021. So by the time I actually show up for the in-person bubonic on a year from now, hopefully I will have both books for sale. Um, so that's my reading. Thank you. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hey. Thank you. So who has questions? I was going to ask, uh, can you tell yes. us what you have coming up on Tor.com? What's going on with that? Uh, I've, been writing, uh, Tor I've been writing for Tor.com, which is an award-winning webzine that talks about pop culture as well as has uh, fiction as well. Um, and uh, I've been... I've written a bunch of different things for them. Uh, currently, I am doing a rewatch of Star Trek Voyager, uh, which just started in January, and I'm in the third season right now. Um, uh, probably by the time this actually shows up at Bubonicon, I might be at the fourth season. But um, I'm, I'm doing that rewatch of Voyager. I've already done rewatches of the original Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation, of Deep, and of Deep Space Nine. In addition, I've been reviewing every episode of each new Star Trek series as it comes out. So I've written reviews of each episode so far of Discovery, of Picard, of Short Treks, and of Lower Decks. And that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Um, and uh, I've also got, I also did a feature called the uh, Four Color to 35 Millimeter, the great superhero movie rewatch. Um, that started in August of 2017. And then in January of this year, I caught up to real time <laughs> and then covered all of them. Uh, it's still gonna come back as an occasional feature uh, every six months to a year or so, depending, I'm going to look back at what new superhero movies, specifically, um, uh, the feature specifically covers uh, movie, live action movies based on superhero comic books. Um, so obviously things like, you know, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the DC Extended Universe and the Christopher Nolan Batman films. And, and I started all the way back with Superman and the Mole Men and the 1966 Batman and worked my way forward to Joker. And then that's where I wound up at uh, January of 2020. And then in June of this year, I covered uh, three more films, uh, Bloodshot uh, and Birds of Prey, which had both come out this year. And also one I missed the first time, uh, Faust, uh, which actually came out in 2000, but I, I hadn't covered it during the first run through. Um, at the end of this year, assuming any more movies are actually released while the apocalypse is going on, um, I'm gonna cover whatever does get released. Um, certainly I'm going to cover The Old Guard, which was released on Netflix. Um, if Black Widow and or Wonder Woman 1984 and or The King's Man do actually get released, like we're hoping they will sometime, then I'll cover them as well. So. And I write other stuff for them as well. Uh, I reviewed the second season of The Umbrella Academy. I reviewed uh, the first season of Warrior Nun. You're not talking to fans of Warrior Nun here, I'll tell you that. It seemed to be all talking, no action. <laughs> I... It, I, it was I, I my I, I had parts of it that were brilliant and parts of it that weren't so much. Um, I I liked um, uh, the I liked the interactions among the different warrior nuns um, and uh, and and particular the the two leads I thought were really good and the acting was excellent uh, through all of it for the most part. Um, I, I I have very little patience with the reluctant hero trope. Um, 
the the I, I, I did not like that it took until episode seven of a 10 episode season for the warrior nun to actually become the warrior nun in a TV show called Warrior Nun. Um, let's just, there's no reason for it. And it's just wasting everybody's time because you know she's gonna become the warrior nun eventually because that's what the freaking show is called. So yeah. Explain our reluctance because we've only watched the first three. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah, okay. Oh, we knew it was coming. Speaking of- Well, yeah, like I said, it's called Warrior Nun. Yeah. Uh, real quick, since you've had so much association with Star Trek, what's your overall opinion of CBS Access's various attempts? Um, I love what they're doing generally. Um, the individual execution obviously varies from show to show and from episode to episode. But in general, this is, this is the sort of thing I think that they should have been doing years ago. Um, and and the, the streaming platform is a unique opportunity for them to do, to really take advantage of the great breadth of the Star Trek universe. Um, you know, they can do Picard, they can do Discovery, they can do Strange New Worlds, they can do animated series, they can do all the different things they're planning. I think it's great. Um, I, I, you know, it it's taking advantage of the storytelling opportunities that have really been there since 1993. When Deep Space Nine debuted, it changed the nature of what Star Trek is. Up until then, Star Trek was, these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. And that's all it was. When Deep Space Nine debuted, it expanded the focus to basically anything that takes place in that universe. And the philosophy that Secret Hideout is taking is, it's a big universe, let's play in it. Um, you know, we've got so many things available to us, you know, you got the 22nd century, you got the 23rd century, you got the 24th century, and you've got beyond that now with, with what, where Discovery is going. I think it's great. Um, I love it. And, uh, you know, even in, not everything is necessarily going to work, obviously, because not everything ever works. But I think it's a great approach generally to take with the franchise. And I think it's, 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 it's a nifty thing. And really quick, because we're about out of time, uh, your beloved to, bro to brown coats because you did this Serenity novelization. Yes. Now that Titan is all of a sudden doing original novels, have you had any thoughts about proposing one? I'd love to. Um, I don't know that they're doing any more beyond the three they contract. Um, I didn't know they even had the license until it was announced. Um, and uh, I don't know, I don't know one way or the other, um, whether they're going to be doing any more beyond the three they contracted for originally. Um, the entire publishing industry has gotten slowed down considerably uh, this year for reasons that should be fairly obvious. Um, particularly mainstream publishing, uh, of which Titan is considered like, small press publishing has actually been not as badly affected because a lot of small and medium press business is done via eBooks, which isn't affected by the pandemic. Uh, having said that, it's still, it's affecting everybody. Um, but in particular, the larger publishers have, everything has slowed down a lot. I don't know what Titan's further plans are for more Firefly. Um, if there are, I would love to write one. I even have a novel proposal in mind, um, but I don't know. I don't know if they even are going to be doing more. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Keith, for doing this for the virtual con, and my pleasure. Looking forward to seeing you next year. Me too. <laughs>